Hello sports fans and welcome to another edition, the second edition of the Daily Nostradamus. I'm your host Dominic Slattery. Today we'll talk about the Wilds defeat of a very good Montreal Canadiens team last night. 2-1 to one at home. Courtesy of Darcy Kemper, Jason Pominville, and Charlie Coyle. Charlie Coyle continues to pull off highlight reel goals that were expected of him after the trade I mentioned in the previous podcast, or uh, show, sorry about that. Um, he is driving to the net a lot more this year, and he's actually finishing when he does. And it, it helps that you do it on a regular basis like he's doing it from game to game. Jason Pominville had another strong game and continues to pick up the scoring slack after it looked like he had hands of stone the first 30-odd games of the year. He's starting to pick it up and becoming the Jason Pominville that scored 30 goals a couple of years ago, and he's even showing flashes of even the lesser 18-goal Jason Pominville of a year ago. I thought Darcy Kemper had another strong game in place of Dubnik. He made a critical save on Pacioretty in the second or third period, maybe third I want to say, that was very critical in keeping it a 2-1 game. Um, the Wild got jobbed by the officials and the linesmen again, as it should have been probably a 4-1 to one game at most, but of course, they don't, the cameras inside of the nets, for some reason, at XL Energy Center and other arenas this year, can't pick up when a goal just barely by the skin of its um, material can get over the line. Because clearly, that Parisi goal was a goal. Even if the officials um, intended to blow the whistle or not, the Wild got jobbed on that one. And Pominville earlier in the game could have had two goals, but that one was called a no goal on the ice. And by the way, they didn't give any explanation to any of the fans. Um, and I'm not in the minority on this, but if they did that in other games and arenas around the league, they'd be pissed too. That's just the way it works. Like You need to give an explanation to the fans of why this is a no goal. Like Generally, with other um, games I've seen in the past couple years from the Wild or just watching the league in general, they do a pretty damn good job at explaining, but all of a sudden they um, let that slip this year for some odd reason and it's, it's really frustrating and disappointing. But at any rate, um, I thought uh, Koivu had another strong game. He was a beast offensively. He um, started the transition game a lot more often than not for the Wild last night. So another strong game from the captain, Captain Koivu. Um, let's transition over to baseball and the free agents that have signed in the last month or so. I was I had this up for the last show that I was going to do, um, but I accidentally deleted the other part I was going to break it into to include it in uh, the last episode. So I already had something done, but I'll redo it and re-talk about it anyways. So to start off, I think the Johnny Cueto deal could end up hurting the Giants. Not because he's not a good pitcher, but the length of term and the fact that his durability wasn't as good last year in the playoffs. Um, he had a really strong game six, I believe it was, in the World Series, where he had a complete game shutout or one run uh, win for the Royals. But uh, other than that, he was uh, terrible coming over from Cincinnati. And I seen it was reported around baseball that he had a strained flexor um, muscle in his shoulder or his elbow. So that contributed a lot to his struggles from what I've read. So that might be a underwhelming signing when it's all said and done in six years from now. 
But who knows? It could be a good one because the Giants generally know what they're doing when it comes to bringing in players. There's a reason they've uh, developed and drafted and won a bunch of World Series in the last five years every other year, it seems like, because they're a decently run organization, probably one of the top organizations that's run with the Royals and Cardinals in all of baseball right now. At least out of the smaller market teams, the Yankees are obviously always going to continue to improve because they got big bankrolls, but that's another story. Um, David Price, I think the David Price um, deal for the Red Sox, I think we could see a different David Price this year just because, as you guys know that are watching this, Fenway Park's a hitter's park, and I think because teams will be banging the ball off the green monster and over the green monster for home runs, I think that'll hurt his ERA, and in turn, he'll pitch a little bit less of an innings load than he's pitched generally in most of his career, and I think his postseason numbers are really concerning, but if Boston in that ballpark with a good offense, if Boston's hitters can back them up more often than not and get on base and score them four or five runs a game, I think that should be plenty for him. And they have a lot of guys that can get on base with Bogards and Betts and Pedroia and, of course, the big fella, Big Poppy, David Ortiz. Um, so I think they'll be all right as long as they can uh, get consistent offense and his starts to back them up. I think he should uh, carry the mail for them. But... Like I said, we'll see once it comes to playoff time if a different David Price rises up from the ashes. Um, going back to the Giants real quick, Jeff Samarja, the other pitcher that they signed, the former Cub and White Sox and A, he, I think, could even be a worse signing than uh, Cueto because he had a drop in velocity for them and he was giving up a lot more hits to innings pitched. His K through 9 was down. I heard uh, at times throughout the season he was said to be tipping his pitches. I don't um, know uh, why a veteran like him would be doing that. you think he would know a lot better. So he really uh, hurt his stock. So I was in, in free agency this year. So I was generally surprised that he got as good a money, $90 million over 5 as he did, because I thought he was very underwhelming. I'd take him on the twin staff in a heartbeat, but that's not saying much when you got Tricky Ricky Nolasco, who is aptly named because it seems like he teases you at times, but then most of the times he teases you with a stint on the disabled list because he um, he's made of... Uh, of um, Chalk, it seems like, because he's so brittle. Um, but that's also another topic for another day. Um, let's talk uh, Vikings. Um, what do you guys think? Do you think Zimmer is a should be a big credit for this year? Or do you think uh, it's better players and personnel? Because I know the rookies have made a big contribution, like Daniil Hunter and... Diggs and uh, a couple other players that we have on the roster that weren't here last year. I think Mike Wallace is going to pick it up eventually. I think um, you guys will see that eventually, and we're starting to see that with his uh, touchdown in Arizona and his nice 34-yard catch against the Bears. I think part of the reason why he's not featured more isn't his fault. I think it it's the lack of seven-step drops that Bridgewater can take because of um, the poor offensive line and the two injuries to Lodeholt and Sullivan. I think they're having to do more three-step drops and quick hitters like slants and curls and comebacks than they wanted to do coming into the season because I think previously we've seen that Norv likes to run posts and go routes generally a lot more than he has this year. With the Vikings, um, I think uh, it's a hell of a job that Zimmer's done managing um, the team's expectations, but also not being too um, 
down on him for having three defensive starters out like Smith, Barr, and Joseph and still expecting them to compete on a week-in and week-out basis. He, I think he's a major reason why we were even competitive at Arizona two weeks ago because we seen in Cincinnati in 2013, I think it was his last year there or second to last year there in 2012, but regardless, we saw when he was there that he can um, somehow, and I don't know how he does it, but he can somehow manage injuries and still get very good performances out of his players on D and still win games. Because he was without Vontez Perfect, or I mean Vincent Ray, I'm sorry, and Vontez Perfect, who was an undrafted free agent for them that they signed um, during training camp. Perfect had to replace Vincent Ray, and he made Perfect into a Pro Bowl player, and now Perfect's a household name among linebackers in the NFL. And then he was without Leon Hall, and I'm pretty sure George Iloka, too. So they were without three or four defensive starters, too, and he still got them to the playoffs. Granted, I think they lost to Houston or some underwhelming, nondescript team that was overachieving that year. But regardless, Zimmer's the real deal. And another thing he does well, what I like about Zim, and this is translated to a lot more wins because he does this well, is I think under previous coaching staffs that we've had here, um, Childress and Frazier, they were terrible at making second half adjustments. And we saw that several times, and it led to bad seasons from us and very underwhelming and disappointing results even when we were expected to be halfway decent. Because we'd come out of the locker room at half and not change anything that we did poorly from the first half. And um, we would get out coached, and the clock management by the other teams would be significantly better than that of what the Vikings would put out on a weekly basis. And I think Zimmer has shown he very rarely gets out coached because... Um, he has a significant amount of experience in the league, like 15 to 20 years experience. And I think having Norv on his staff and um, some of the other experienced, like Prefer, the special teams coach, I think that helps too because uh, they've been around the block and they've seen about as many things as Zimmer does, so it makes for a cohesive unit as far as the coaching staff. I think Norv is... Um, a really good offensive coordinator at times, but I've been underwhelmed with him at other times. Like his um cha his choices to go into the half without um trying to go for a touchdown and just sitting on the ball and sitting on the lead or sitting on a three point deficit or whatever it may be, seven point deficit at the time. I think his choices not to be aggressive before the half, I think, have been a question mark and a head-scratcher. But other than that, his third-quarter play-calling and fourth-quarter play-calling at times has been magnificent this year. I think he's done a hell of a job, specifically the last three weeks. I think he's done a, a his best work as a Vikings coordinator. I think um, it's very impressive what he's been able to ask Teddy to do and Teddy to do it well. Teddy's another guy that I've been impressed with. Like a lot of people, there was a lot of whispers that is this really the guy, you know, but I think the, for our organization, but I think the offensive line, like I mentioned previously has a lot to do with that. I think the receivers not getting open. We saw that in the Oakland game. Otherwise, I think if they would have got open in the Oakland game, we would have won that by a, more significant margin than we did um, because the Raiders had one of the worst pass defenses in the league at that time. I think they're still in the top five, close to the Giants this week's opponent, who, by the way, I'll give you a little scouting report on how I think the game's going to go this week against them. I think this isn't going to be a huge shocker to everybody, but I think Odell Beckham being out really hurts them. Because Rashad Jennings leaves a lot, a lot less to be desired. That's why he was a second string in uh, Jacksonville behind 
Toby Gerhardt, of all people, Viking fans, know what Toby Gerhardt brings to the 